Well, I want to welcome all of you. If this is your first time with us, I'm thankful that you're here, whether you're at Vincent's or Princeton campus or maybe joining us online or here at Washington. I'm thankful that you're joining us for the very last sermon in our series that's been titled uh, Five Words That Will Change Your Life. And we're looking at biblical words that have biblical meaning and definition that will radically change your life when you get to the depth of them and understand them from a divine aspect or a divine uh, 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 vision, in a sense. And uh, the word today is sovereign. And I think it probably best set it up by uh, reminding you about uh, some children's genre books that were simply titled Choose Your Own Adventure. Do you remember those books? Some of you probably read them faithfully. Sometimes they're called secret path books, a uh, kind of story where you get to decide how the character of the story goes and the plot they get to go through. And uh, you kind of get to navigate at the end of the chapter by answering some questions, uh, what you want them to do next. One of the ones I would read to my kids all the time was Be Your Own Duck Commander when uh, the, you know, Duck Dynasty was big. It was The Adventures of Psy. And I remember this one in particular where it was Uncle Psy in Outer Space. And we would read it at bedtime and we would ask what the next adventure for Psy should be. You want to go explore the moon? Then go to chapter 7. If you want to go explore Mars, go to chapter 13. If you want Psy to stay on earth and drink sweet tea, just stop the book and close it up, I guess. Uh, but that's the way the, the books ran. And if you read them very often and you read the same one often like I did at bedtime, you recognize that there was only like two outcomes that were, were given. You had multiple adventures that you could choose and multiple plots and scenarios but when it came right down to it, everything kind of came back to, to two scenarios, either keep Psy on earth or let him keep exploring outer space. It kind of reminds me of life a little bit. And, uh, you know, if you think about it, there are some things that we get to decide in life. There's a whole lot of things, actually, that we get to decide in life. And, and uh, you make decisions about a spouse or where you go to college. You make decisions about a whole lot of things, what job you ultimately want. Uh, if you want to come to church on a Sunday morning or not, you make all these kinds of decisions and they're based upon you. But when you think about it, there's some decisions that we don't get to make, aren't there? Like, just think for a moment, the decisions that you didn't get to make for yourself. You didn't get to, you didn't get to determine your gender, did you? You didn't get to choose that gender. You didn't get to determine the race or the nationality you came from. You didn't get to determine your household was dysfunctional or functional. You didn't get to determine that. You didn't get to determine if your, your parents stayed together or went through a divorce. You didn't get to determine what kind of economic level you were born into. You didn't get to determine any of that stuff. You didn't get to determine if you're going to go bald or have the hair for the rest of your life. You didn't get to determine any of that stuff. You just kind of well, you just kind of had it predetermined for you in some sense, didn't you? And yet now we're all kind of playing the, the hand that we've been dealt. We're kind of living now our own adventure from that moment on. Some of us are even now living our own misadventures, so to speak. And uh, for many in this room, I think we, if we could have chosen our own adventure, like if this were like a choose your own adventure book, I don't know if any of us would be like, yeah, this is the way we wrote it. Like this is the way we dreamt it. This is the way we wanted it. I don't know, maybe, maybe it is, I, I'm not certain, but I'd say for the majority of the world, they would look at their life and go, yeah, this is not exactly how I planned it. Uh, there were some things I chose, there's things that I chose that were wrong also, and there were some things that were chosen for me. And somewhere in there, guys, is what we would call the sovereignty of God. I mean, like, he controls all things, and he's guiding our steps, but is he guiding all of our steps? Is he, is he predetermining every dust particle and every molecule in your body? Is he in control of all your decisions now that you become just like a faithful robot to, the God, to our God? I think to get a better handle on sovereignty is to look into some stories that just focus deeply on the sovereignty of God. One of them is the story of Joseph found in Genesis chapter 37. It's in the Bible in the chair rack in front of you. Pull it out with me or get on your device or whatever it is and get to Genesis 37. I think another great book that you can read about the sovereignty of God where God's name is never mentioned, a beautiful book about a beautiful woman, is the book of Esther. And if you have time sometime this week or maybe over this weekend, extended weekend, you can read that book of Esther probably in about 20 minutes, 25 minutes. If you're a slow reader like me, 30 minutes. And uh, you can hear all about how God interweaves his way through the life of somebody, even though he's never mentioned at all in that book, but you know he's there. That's, that's sovereignty. Genesis chapter 37 introduces us to a man who did and didn't get to choose his own adventure. He did and didn't. Uh, some of it was written for him and others, he, other parts of it, he was writing his own story. Uh, but it's a story uh, that is true. It's backed by ancient Egyptian history. Um, and more attention is focused on this character named Joseph in Genesis than any other event or character in all of that large book of Genesis. And despite his plight, despite the unfairness, despite the trouble that he'd went through and the hardship and the goods and the bad, he never fell away from God. And he always trusted in this. God was in control. He always trusted that God was in control. When times were chaos, when times were calm, God was in control and he lived his life that way. And he was determined to keep God the focus of his life. 
even when he couldn't understand what God was doing. He was determined to make sure that he's holding tight to God. Even in those moments when the storm was raging on, he was determined to be faithful to God, even when he didn't know what God was up to. Now, if you just kind of look around in Genesis 37, you're going to find a lot of dysfunction in Joseph's family. He was, he didn't, you know, he didn't choose that own adventure for himself. His parents chose that adventure for him. As a matter of fact, his dad named Jacob. It means deceiver. And he was a conniver and a scoundrel many times in his youth, especially. And uh, he had four wives. Now, if you want to mess up a family, you get four wives together in the same house and, and you try to not show partiality. Well, he couldn't, he couldn't achieve that. And so Rebecca was his favorite of the wives. And uh, Joseph was born to Rebecca, and uh, because Rebecca was Jacob's favorite, stay with me now, because Rebecca was Jacob's favorite, her son Joseph was, was Jacob's favorite son. And he had a lot of sons, he had a baker's dozen, as a matter of fact, he had a lot of, a lot of kids. And, um, and, and Joseph was his favorite, and so much of his favorite that unfairly he pronounced him to all of the other boys this is my favorite <laughs> that's going to cause some trouble right in the household and he gave him a special coat you guys probably know the story coat of many colors and i don't know if joseph had the option to wear that or keep it in the closet i'm not sure which it was uh, but he certainly wore it um, i think maybe he liked the title of being honored in the favorite he's 17 years old he loves everything about it but his brothers hated it hated it all his brothers were shepherds and they worked by the sweat of their brow and where's joseph joseph is in the air-conditioned house uh, working with mom and they hated every, everything about it. They hated that he was honored by dad. They hated that he had a, a cush life with mom. And, and they hated him even further because Joseph was having some strange dreams, dreams about him becoming honored and him becoming powerful and his whole family bowing down to him. Now, if you're a kid and you have that kind of dream, keep that to yourself, okay? Joseph must have had an arrogancy to him or maybe, maybe a stupidity to him. He's around the dinner table and he knows his brothers hate him. And he knows they all know that he's daddy's favorite, mommy's favorite, and everyone despises him. And he says, hey, I had this dream. You want to hear about it? <laughs> and he says, here's what it is. You guys are all going to bow down to me one day. And he tells them that dream. Now that, come on, man, choose your own adventure. That's a bad, that's a bad, you shouldn't have chosen that chapter, Joseph. That was a bad chapter to choose. And so they head into the fields the next day and the brothers go to the fields. Joseph decides, I'm going to go check on my brothers and see what they're up to. That's where we get into our story, Genesis chapter 37. Look at verse 19 with me. Here comes that dreamer, they say. Verse 20, come now, let's kill him. <laughs> that's, that's, that's choosing your own adventure. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of the cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devour him. Then we'll see what comes of, then we'll see what comes of his dreams. Like we're, we're gonna put an end to his dreams. And, and what you see here, guys, is... About 12 brothers who were putting their heads together for premeditated murder. And one of the older brothers speaks up in verse 26. Judah says to his brothers, what will it gain if we kill our brother and cover it up with blood? What will that gain us? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and, and not lay our hands on him. After all, he's our brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. So one of his brothers more of an entrepreneur rather than a murderer and says, listen, I don't want to kill him, but let's sell him. I mean, that seems like the healthier thing to do. And so there is a group of merchants coming, some Ishmaelites, and they sell Joseph after holding him into a pit into slavery. And then they're like no longer thinking of Joseph, they're thinking of themselves. So they're going, now, what, what will we do now when his mom, Rebecca, and his dad start asking some questions? And so they take that coat of many colors and they rip it up and they throw animal blood on it and they come back home and they say, dad, we're sorry to tell you your favorite son's been killed by a wild animal. And, uh, and Jacob grieves the loss of his son, Joseph, believing that he's been dead forever, but his brothers know better. Uh, what I think is interesting is they deceive the deceiver. Dads, what comes around goes around. And uh, jo Joseph is alive, was in a pit, sold into slavery. And, and uh, there's a man who comes into Joseph's life by the name of Potiphar. Potiphar is a very powerful, prestigious guy in the nation of Egypt. Egypt at this time is a superpower. There, there's probably been no other greater superpower uh, greater uh, than the nation of Egypt in its power, in its riches, and its expansion. And uh, Potiphar probably had many slaves, hundreds of slaves that he bought that day. And out of all those slaves, Joseph is just one of them. Potiphar is what is called the captain of the guard, which if you were kind of to put that in today's terms, he would be like the lead of the secret service of the president. And so he was the lead security guard for the Egyptian king that they titled 
Pharaoh. And so in Genesis chapter 39, verse 2, it says that the Lord was with, the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. So here is this twist of events, this misadventure, choose your own adventure thing happens, and they throw Joseph into the pit. And the Lord, though, is with Joseph because that's sovereignty. That's how God works. He's not, he's not going to abandon you. So that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master, who is Potiphar. Verse 3, when his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Genesis 39 uh, middle of verse four, Potiphar put him in charge of his whole household and entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and to all that he'd owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. And then the blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and on the field. Verse six, so Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care with Joseph in charge and did not concern himself with anything except for the food that he ate. Like he's like, this, this guy's doing so good. Uh, someone's hand of favor is upon him. It must be God's hand of favor. And so Joseph's such a, a good slave and has so much uh, attributes and so much uh, ability that we're just going to put him in charge of everything. I don't have to worry about anything. And, and Joseph goes from riches to rags to riches. He goes from the pit now to, to the palace. And if there were a story that you want to end happily ever after, then you better just shut your Bible right now and say, okay, that's a good story. Like, it's all over. Good stuff. Riches to rags, back to riches again. But that's not, the how, that's not how Joseph's story is going to work. And that's not how our life works, is it? It doesn't go riches to rags to riches and everything stays good. It's just not the way it works. Um, as a matter of fact, sometimes it gets really bad. And there, there comes great adversity and there comes some evil and there comes some twists and turns that we didn't expect, like adventures we didn't even choose for ourselves. Some, some misadventures we chose and there's regret and there's heartache and there's consequences, but, but some of it was just forced upon us. So with that said, let's just stop here from Joseph's story. Let's get into our story for a minute and let's just see how God weaves, God weaves his way through our life um, because he's doing it in your life just like he did in Joseph's life. And one thing we need to know about God's sovereignty is this, that God is in control, but he is not controlling. Did you catch that? Let's just say it out loud. God is in control, but isn't controlling. Some people that say that God kind of worked his way amongst the brothers and inspired the brothers to throw Joseph into that pit, which means that God inspired evil. God inspired hurt. God inspired pain. God inspired failure. Or maybe even God orchestrated all that stuff. I've heard it termed like that before, that God orchestrated all this and has now put us through it to test us, or refine us by fire, as if God wants to see his children fail, as if God wants to see his children hurt, as if God's kind of like this puppet master that wants his children to walk through pains and anxieties and, and, and malpractice and, and all sorts of evils in this world, as if God is saying a maniacal God and just kind of controlling all aspects of evil and allowing us to walk through this evil and like we're no longer free now, we just kind of have to walk through the gauntlet that God's created for us and Gosh, man, that, that sounds like a maniacal God to me. That doesn't sound like a loving God, does it to you? Like, here, here's a little bit of hurt. Here's some trauma. Here's a school shooting. Here's an accident that's going to kill a teenager and, and wreck your, your, your teen's life as well. Now, I'm going to make that happen. I'm going to orchestrate it. I'm going to move it through it. That doesn't sound like the God I know. As a matter of fact, that's not the God of the Bible. That's a God that many Christians have assumed to be. It's, even some Christian groups have said, this is the way God works. He controls evil and he controls good. No, he doesn't. He orchestrates good and he triumphs over evil. And the evil is caused by you and me. Let's just say that, let's just say you're a division manager, okay? Huge business, huge corporation. And you have like hundreds of employees under your care. And, and it's your job, you cannot possibly do all the work. Well, you, maybe you could, I don't know. Uh, you could probably do all the work, let's just say. You could, you could do all the controlling of the company. But you decide that your job is to hold the culture and hold the responsibilities and make these employees productive and give them a plan and a goal. And so that's what you create for them. And you're not doing their job. As a matter of fact, if, as the division manager, if you had to do their job, then they wouldn't be needed and you'd just take over or they'd become robotic. And so if the division manager's job, your job is to hold cultures, to hold responsibility, hold productivity, and, and to make sure that there's a plan in place and you're achieving the goals of the company. And in a sense, that's what God's... That's what God's goal is. 
If we're kind of like, in a sense, the employees in the story, we've been asked and tasked to be productive. We've been asked and tasked to hold the culture. We've been asked and tasked to go along with the company policies and the plan. And yet he is there to make sure that the culture set. He's there to make sure that we're empowered. He's there to make sure the plan is established and going. And friends, that's the best illustration I can give you. But God's not a micromanager is what I'm trying to tell you. Oh, he could be. (laughs) He absolutely could be. But for your sake and my sake, he's not. Because if he were, we wouldn't be needed. If we were just programmed to love or programmed to do the things we were to do, then we wouldn't be needed. We wouldn't have free choice to love him or to hurt him or to push away from him. And that's what freedom of choice ultimately is. It's a response to love or not to love. And the Bible tells us that God can micromanage. He can. And some of you are like, wait a minute, God can micromanage. He can. He absolutely can. Psalm 115 verse 3 says, our God is is in heaven, and he does whatever he pleases. Like he can do, he, he made the world, he owns the world, he created the world, he can do what he wants with the world. Absolutely true. But you would run under the assumption, if you were to believe, that he's like now micromanaging because of that, that he, his pleasure is to control everything about you. And it's not his pleasure to control everything about you. It's not his pleasure at all. As a matter of fact, a few verses later on in that very same chapter, it says that the highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth... He has given to whom? You and I, mankind. And God has freely given us autonomy, and he knows that his love will win out. Even though that we make some misadventures in our life, God will somehow help to guide our steps. And there's kind of like this this authoring of our story, of us writing the story and God writing the story. And I don't know when they intertwine, and I don't know where they weave in and out. Uh, It's easy to see it in hindsight in Joseph's story. And I think one day in heaven we'll see it in our story. But for now, we've got to get back to our story, the story of Joseph. Because if you want Joseph to live happily ever after for the rest of your life, close the book. But if you want to see Joseph take a turn for the worst, (laughs) turn to Genesis 39. Let's turn to Genesis 39. Let's start in verse 6, halfway through. Now Joseph was well-built and handsome. That's a good description of a man. Joseph was well-built and handsome. He's setting up a story that's about to happen. Verse 7, and after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. She's not mincing words, is she? But he refused. I love that. Like three words, like so profound, come to bed with me, he refused. Could it be that simple to walk away from temptation? He says, with me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in this house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. And my master has withheld nothing from me except you. Because you're his wife. How then can I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? That's an interesting way to put it, isn't it? Not I'm going to sin against my my master. Not I'm going to sin against you. His ultimate authority, his ultimate loyalty was to to God. And he didn't want to ruin the relationship with God, yet alone with his master. In verse 10, "And, and though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. And not only was he not prepared for this temptation, this temptation was a daily temptation for him. And it was inescapable. He was in charge of the palace. She lived in the palace. She could go wherever he went. And wherever he went, she was. And she continued to whisper in his ear, go to bed with me. And he continued to say, no, no. That's how he wrote his adventure story. No. How would you write it from there? Okay, so here's your life now. Let's just say you're Joseph and life has not gone as you've dreamed it to go. You've gone from riches to rags. You've been thrown in the pit, despised by your brothers. Your dad thinks you're dead. You're now in the palace. You're in a new culture. You're now in a new environment. You're up to your own good and your own rules. And now life has not gone as you want it to go. And maybe you're bitter at God a little bit. Maybe some of us would say, God hasn't been faithful to me. Why should I be faithful to him? What's the big deal? She wants to do this with me? I wouldn't mind doing that with her. There's nothing holding you back except maybe the ire of Potiphar. It's not the way Joseph rolls. He says, I don't know what this is all about, but I want to be true to my God. And I knew that he was in control when I was in that pit. Like I knew he was in control when I was going through some problems. And when I'm at the top of my game right now in the palace, I'm going to continue to side with him because I know he's in control right now too. And I will simply refuse to go to bed with her. 
You know, the Bible says it like this in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Run from anything that stimulates youthful lust. Instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. What he's saying is you run to righteousness and flee from temptation. God didn't put that there in front of you. He didn't put that there in to trip you up. He wants you to run to him. That's your freedom of choice in his sovereignty. And you start getting some good friends around you who love the Lord and want to, the best for you and see you as a soul. See you more as just a, a physical being. They see you as a spiritual being and they want some spiritual destiny for you to be with the Lord. You have that choice. You can run from temptation. God did not put that there for you to stumble. You can run to him. And your next adventure can be not a misadventure, but a true adventure of following God and saying no to sinful lusts. And Joseph's situation gets out of his control here in this moment because it's out of his control. She relentlessly keeps saying, come to bed with me. He keeps saying no, and she makes up this story out of her anger that he will not give in to lust and go after her. And she pulls his coat off of him. It's interesting that a coat is an important part of his life a couple of times. I'm not even sure what it means. And she holds that coat and she runs to her husband and says, your slave, Joseph, had tried to rape me. And without any kind of trial, without any kind of investigation, Potiphar takes the side of his wife and immediately throws Joseph into prison, which is dungeon, and he, he's has to leave the palace. So he goes from the pit to the palace to prison because he's faithful to God. So here's the question. When your dreams turn into a nightmare, where's God in all that? When, when things go south for you, when that average Friday seems like a normal Friday until you get the the resignation uh, and the layoff and it turns your whole world upside down. You don't know where you're going to go for your next job. Where's God in all that? When the words divorce come out of your spouse's mouth and you knew the marriage was rough but you didn't know it was that bad and the papers are being filed, where's God in all that? When someone barges down the door of a school and shoots up classroom kills innocent kids and teachers where's god in that tragedy when you're you know having a normal monday until things seem off in your spouse and you go to the doctor's office and they find out it's an advanced tumor of the brain i mean i just we folks right now we've got a family in our congregation that's just going through it that just Sunday was normal, last Sunday was normal, Monday was not normal. They go to the doctor, advanced tumor, and, and Tammy Brown, who many of you know, and, and Jason and Tammy now are back and forth from the hospital and, and doctors and what's next for surgery. And it's like, it just seems like from the doctor's point of view, so hopeless. And like, where's God? Where's God when the dreams turn into a nightmare? Where is he in all that? Because like, I think there's a lot of us like, God, we're trying to live right. Where are you? Why are you making this stuff all wrong? And I know God's looking for men and women to be obedient to him, even in the tough times and the challenging times. And I think there's times when the storms rage on and God lets the storms rage on because he's not gonna, he's not gonna calm the storm, but he certainly wants to calm his kids. Certainly wants to calm his kids. He wants men and women to persevere. He wants men and women to overcome temptation. I, I get all that. Man, I, I think there's gotta be some point in your life where you've looked around and you're like, this is so bad. This is so horrific. This is so terrible. This is so chaotic. Where's God? I thought he was in control. I thought he was all, I thought he was all powerful. And you, you have these questions. We all have these questions. Joseph had these questions. Joseph has this new chapter that's beginning to unfold for him. And, and he starts this new chapter in life, not in the palace. He starts this new chapter in his life in prison, in a dungeon. And here's what it says in Genesis uh, chapter 39, verse 20, about halfway through. It says, but while Joseph was there in prison, check this out. The Lord was with him. Isn't that awesome? Okay, well, Joseph was there in prison. The Lord was with them, and he showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. You want to know where God is in all this tragedy? You want to know where God is when you're in the hospital or when you have someone dying in the nursing home or when you're at the funeral home? You want to know where God is in all this? He is right there with you. That's his sovereignty. He's there with you. Did he, did he march that evil into your life? No. Did he will that evil into your life? No. Did he allow that evil to go through in your life? Yes. 
And he is right there with you. And so for a moment, let's talk about why God doesn't step into our calamity. Let's talk about why God doesn't step into our mess. Let's talk about why God doesn't step into these outrageously evil situations and just put an, an end to it. Could he? Yes, absolutely he could. Why does he bar us from failure? Why does he keep us from hurt and pain? Why, why does he just, I'll tell you why. Because some of this, some of the story we've written for ourselves as humanity and for, for our own. And we've created some misadventures and these misadventures have gotten really out of hand, really out of hand. And the, and the chapters that we've written today are, are some, of, some of what was based off of chapters of yesterday. And now they're determining what we're seeing today, like evil and hurt and pain. I mean, it all starts to pile up like a big snowball running downhill, getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and it seems unstoppable. So where's God in this? Well, sometimes God just says, I'm going to allow you to go through this sinful stuff. I'm going I'm to allow you to endure this so that you see that I'm, I'm gracious and merciful. But then we ask, why isn't God stopping any of this stuff? Well, here's the truth about sovereignty. God is all-powerful. He could stop this anytime. But here's the thing. He restrains his power. Let's just say this out loud. God is all-powerful but restrains his power. The world would define sovereignty like this. Power and authority. Power and authority. Power and authority. And they'd say, if God is all-powerful, why doesn't he stop evil? If God is all-powerful, why does he allow us to go through evil? Why doesn't he just put an end to it all? The Bible defines, the Bible defines sovereignty like this. Listen closely. The ability to overcome and find victory. <laughs> Same word, different, different definition. Same vocab, different... different. Power and authority is how the world says it. God says it. No, it's the ability to overcome the mess of this world and still find victory. It's the ability to overcome the evil in this world and still find victory. It's the ability to overcome the messes that we've created and God's able to still find victory. God, we think, must be working both sides of the table, causing evil, causing good. Or sometimes we think God's not powerful enough to stop evil. So which is it? Here's what it is. You and I have some free will. You and I get to author this story with God. He's allowed us to author this story together and kind of choose our own adventure. And because we've chosen sin, we've spun things out of control. It's hurt me. It's hurt you. It's hurt this world. And it's just kind of piled up. And yet, even though we have free will, we've made a mess of creation. And God is able still to accomplish, accomplish his purposes and accomplish his good despite all the mess that we've made and the sin we've entered and the evil we've made for this world. Listen, here's how powerful God is. I can't even really explain this, but he's, he's like a, he's so powerful. He's like an elite NFL running back that is playing against a, a defense made up of kindergartners. He's just going to plow them over, run around them. He's going to score his goal every single time. Is there opposition? You bet. But he's going to barrel through the opposition and he's going to overcome. But some of you are like, but doesn't God orchestrate this evil? Doesn't God orchestrate and allow this? No, he doesn't. That, this, this would be like you coming across a, a guy who's playing chess against himself, chess against himself. And he's, he's making his moves and he's spinning the board. He's making those moves. He's spinning the board, making moves. And then you ask him, why are you playing chess against yourself? And he says, it's the only way that I can win. That doesn't show power. It doesn't show power at all, does it? And yet that's, somehow, that's sometimes how we think about God. He's controlling evil and he's controlling good. No, no, no. We've made the evil. He's just, now he has to plow over it like an NFL running back to, to get to his good. But let's just say you come across a guy that's a master chess player. And he's got a long line of opponents lined up. And he is defeating every single opponent that's faced. And all the best chess masters of the world are lined up. And there ain't an opponent that can beat him. He is masterfully beating them, quickly beating them. Who is more powerful, the one who's playing against himself or the one who's taken on every challenger and has shown victory every time? Friends, here's how powerful God is. Here's how God's providential stuff can't be stopped regardless of what misadventure you've made for your life or what misadventure we've made for this world, God is going to accomplish his plan. He showed up to save the world, not as a mighty warrior. He showed up to save the world, not as a superhero. How did he show up to save the world? You tell me. As a baby, as a vulnerable baby to a teenage mother and said, go ahead, world, try it. Go ahead. I'm as vulnerable as I'll ever be. Go ahead and take me out. They tried, didn't they? They tried. Herod tried. The religious leaders tried. And Jesus is going, listen, you can't take, you can't take my life. You can't take my life. As a matter of fact, here's how he said it. No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. For I have the authority to lay it down 
and when I, and when I want to, and I also have to take it back up again. For this is what my father has commanded. Let's get back to Joseph's story. Let's get a better understanding of sovereignty as we close this out. So one night, Pharaoh of Egypt, he's the king of Egypt. He's having this dream, and it troubled him. And the dream is about uh, some famine that has come into the land that's going to stricken the people, and it's going to devour the nation of Egypt. And he's so, it's so real to him that he says, someone needs to interpret this dream and tell me how now to, to, to live life as a leader now because something bad is going to happen. And no one can interpret the dream. And there's an old prison mate of Joseph's that's now a cupbearer to the Pharaoh. So he's eating and drinking the food that Pharaoh's about to eat so it's not poison and making sure that it's safe to eat. And he says, you know, uh, when I was in prison, uh, there was a cellmate of mine that knew how to interpret dreams and God's hand was upon him. He says, his name's Joseph. Uh, And they look him back up. Oh yeah, he's in prison cell, you know, 13B. Let's go get him. And they bring him back up to Pharaoh And Pharaoh says, here's my dream. Would you interpret it? In Genesis chapter 41 now, verse 38, he interprets the dream perfectly. And Pharaoh says, can we find anyone like this guy? Huh? This is my guy. We found him right in the prison. (laughs) He's my guy. Can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the spirit of God? Verse 39, then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there's God's providential step. There's God's sovereignty. Joseph didn't write this story for himself now. God's writing the story. Since God made all this known to you, there's, there's no one so discerning and wise as you. Verse 40 of Genesis 41, you shall be in charge of my palace and all my people are to submit to your orders only with respect to the throne. Will I be greater than you? That is the king of Egypt who just said that. And he said, you're going to be the second most in charge. And so what, what's, the, what's the sovereignty of God in the story of Joseph that we get to see in t- hindsight? He goes uh, to the pit, to the palace, to prison, to prince of Egypt. He didn't know that's the way his story was going to work out. Can you imagine those restless nights in the pit, those restless nights in the prison? Where's God? You've had those kind of stories, haven't you? Where's God? He's about the age of 30. Egypt goes through seven years of feast. He stores up all the grain. And then seven years of famine. And he rations it out so the people would be spared. And he's come from the prison. And now he's got power and prestige and popularity and prominence. And you say, how did this all happen? It's because God was writing his story. And Joseph was writing his story. And Joseph executed the plan perfectly. Egypt is spared. And during that widespread famine, the outskirts of Egypt um, are starving to death. And that's just where his old homestead was. And these guys who he hasn't seen in 22 years show up. It's his brothers. He recognizes them, but they don't recognize him. That's going to be fun. Yeah, you know, now he doesn't look anything like he used to. He, he, he talks like an Egyptian, looks like an Egyptian, walks like an Egyptian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it should have been wow. Whoa. He's 39 years old now. Brothers are clueless, but they're begging for food. They're starving, and Joseph starts to toy with them. Now, if it were me, I would have revealed myself and snapped my fingers and put them to death, but he's far more godly than I am, so he decides, I'm going to test him to see if they really, if they really now are, are regretful for what they've done to me, and so he does, and he finds out they really are regretful, and they tear up, and he can't take it any longer, man. He can't, he can't keep the charade back, and so I guess he wipes off the Egyptian mascara <laughs> and shows himself for who he is, and he says, it's me, it's your brother. Look at Genesis 45. It lets us in on this moment, this beautiful moment that has taken place where these guys are scared to death and Joseph is just weeping. It says, then Joseph can no longer control himself. This is verse one of Genesis 45. Before all the attendants, and he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one, there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. Verse two, Genesis 45. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him. And Pharaoh's household heard about it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? I love that his care is for his dad. Uh, But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were so terrified to be in his presence. 
Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. And when, they, when they'd done so, he said, I'm your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And they were probably thinking, oh, he hasn't forgot about that. <laughs> Verse 5, I, I love these calming words. I love it. This is, the, this is the way to start forgiveness in relationship. And now don't be distressed and don't be angry with yourselves. For selling me here, because it was to save the lives that God sent me ahead of you. Do you think he thought that when he was in the pit? No way. Only till he looked back and said, man, God has been faithful. And I've, I've chosen my own adventures and God has laid some adventures before me. And here's what he's telling them. Guys, this isn't the way I wrote my story. This isn't the way I had it dreamed up. I never thought I'd feel so down. I never thought I'd be so depressed. I never thought I'd be so angry. But don't be angry with yourselves. And don't be down on yourselves. Because all this stuff that had taken place, the good and the bad, God has been able to overcome it all. Even the evil you, you threw at me. Because that's who our God is. And every time I chose another adventure, God was right there. And even times when I had it all laid out in front of me and I couldn't choose an adventure, God was right there. And he has this incredible line in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. Let's just say it out loud because it's so incredible. Let's just say it out loud together. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Don't you love that aspect in life? He says, guys, you threw it all at me. The world's thrown it all at me. Evil has thrown it at me. And regardless of what was thrown at me, God was co-authoring my life. And it was all meant to harm me. But God is able to overcome in his sovereignty and in his power and in his control. He ran through evil like an NFL running back running through a group of kindergartners. Nothing could stop him. And Joseph says, I trusted in God all the way because that's why God is sovereign. He wants you to trust him. Trust him when you're in the pit. Trust him when you're in the palace. Trust him when you're in the prisons. Trust him when you're the prince. That he's in control, that he's powerful. And you remember this. You remember this to your dying day. That anything under God's control is never out of control. Will you say that with me? Anything under God's control is never out of control. No evil can ever stop his plan. Will you pray with me? God, I think we need to hear that today. Our nation and our, our community has been struck by so much hurt and pain recently. And I think, I think it was part of your sovereign providential plan that this sermon was scheduled to be right where it needed to be. And I think we've been in here choosing our adventure in this place because we needed to be here and you'll use it. And we know, we know Father, that you're gonna do some good things even in the midst of tragedy. May that not just be in our head, but may it be in our heart and may we live that way. That when the, the pit and when the prison comes, that we'll be reminded that you're there. And then when we're on the top of the game and we can't think that the world can get any better, we'll be reminded you're there. And may that word get out to those that are grieving today without hope, that are wondering about tomorrow and they don't see, they don't see the horizon of the sun rising. They don't see your providential plan. They don't see your sovereignty. They don't see your salvation. May we be, may we be so quick to get out of here and teach about a God that is sovereign, that overcomes evil with good. We're thankful for doing that on the cross. We're thankful for giving us Jesus who defeated evil so that we can have life eternal with him. And we choose him because we want our adventure to be with you. And we pray these things in Christ's name.